questions here. And for Heidegger, the way in which our being in the world is revealed to us is in, in a slightly complex way through three fundamental um, aspects of, hu of human being. And these are what often gets translated as mood, understanding, and discourse. I'll go through these one by one. The mood, the German word is Befindlichkeit, which has a word like the English find in the middle of it, that we always find ourselves being a certain way. That, you know, you, I meet you on the street and you say, hi George, how are you? I say, I'm all right. I find myself being all right. I don't have to think about whether I'm all right or not. I just say, yeah, it's all right. I, I find myself being a certain way. Mood. But that is also a certain understanding. I have an understanding of myself. I'm the sort of being who could feel all right or not all right. To be able to say I'm all right involves a certain understanding of what it is to be human. But then the third thing, discourse, logos, is that I say it. I have something to say. I don't have an understanding of myself as all right and then find a word for it to fit the word onto it. But it's in saying the word that my understanding of how I find myself being comes to expression. Heidegger's project, he says, is phenomenology under the inspiration of the phenomenology of Husserl. But what is, or what are phenomena? Phenomena are what come to appearance. But for Heidegger, logos is the primary mode in which being in the world comes to appearance. Not visual perception or tactile perception apart from logos, but it's in logos that the world becomes a world for us and we become existing human beings in a world, in our logos with one another. Indeed, he says, if we understand logos in the Greek sense, the original meaning of legain is dilun, it is uncovering. So when I say, look, there's a sparrow, by saying it's a sparrow shows you and reveals it to you as a sparrow. Well, perhaps you already know that, but if you're a three-year-old, you, you don't, and my telling you shows you what that thing is that you're seeing. So language uncovers the world, language presents us with the phenomenon of the world and of our own being in the world. That's great, but there's a problem. Because as speakers of language, of course, we don't make language up. We receive language. We are inducted into an already existing language. And that's not just a matter of learning a vocabulary and a grammar, but learning phrases, figures of speech, ways of talking, and so on. Now, that means that in a sense, as language users, we're always using language secondhand. Derrida would say, I have only one language and it is not my own. That language is something we receive. The language we have wasn't designed to express or to articulate our unique and singular experiences and understandings. It's part of a complex common life. The great risk here, of course, then is that we can say things that we've heard without really understanding them in the light of our own experience. And when that happens, language is no longer uncovering the world, it's covering it up. In Heideggerian terms, discourse, which he uses the German word Rede, becomes Gerede, translated as idle talk or chatter. We're just repeating what others have said without understanding. Now, important here for Heidegger, I think people sometimes misread him at this point and say this is just a kind of manifestation of decadent life in the early 20th century. If you go back to his lectures on Aristotle and to the sort of life of the Greek agora reflected in Aristotle's writings, this is a problem right from the beginning of philosophy because it's built into the structures of language and that we have and can't have language as anything but second hand. And so here I am, you know, talking about being in time, 
and a student might write down, you know, being in time contains important new ideas such as the idea of Dasein and being in the world. Now, of course, that's not wrong. That is correct to say that. But just because the student's writing it down because I've said it doesn't mean that the student really understands. And a student could regurgitate an exam answer or an essay, or a scholar could even regurgitate a book perhaps, or a whole series of books, without necessarily having an original kind of primordial understanding of what is being said in, in language. So in practice, we live in our average everyday way of being. The world is not uncovered, but the world is covered over by this way of talking, this gereda, this idle talk. So what are we to do? How are we to get out of that situation? You know, here Heidegger introduces this term, another of these key terms that's become associated with him, Eigentlichkeit, authenticity. We have to find out what is truly our own and not just what is handed down to us or reflected back to us from our surrounding society. And we have to do this because it's only in this way that we can realise our lives as a whole and make of ourselves uh, a whole, authentic human being. But then there's a problem. How can we be a whole? How can we live as a whole? Now, an object that didn't have time could be a whole, an object that was simply what and as it is. You know, the Greek vase that Keats writes about. Simply a perfect object that doesn't become anything else. But here we are in the middle of a course of becoming. We're always changing, we're living from day to day, we're developing, becoming something new, ceasing to be what we are. We haven't yet lived all our possibilities. These still lie ahead of us. How can we live as a whole? And then there's something else. And that is, of course, all of us are going to die. And for Heidegger, this means that in a sense it, it seems impossible for us to live as our lives as a whole because our end is always going to escape us. And that means we can never really be sure about any of our possibilities in life. Any of the things that we're committed to could be cut short at any time. And indeed, this is one of the motivations as to why we find it so easy to slip into idle talk, secondhand talk, assuring ourselves that everything is in order, everything is in place, the world is well managed and as, as, as it should be. A way of avoiding confronting this terrifying, ineluctable fact that each of us individually must die. So for Heidegger, the only way to, as it were, lift ourselves out of this second-hand life of average everydayness is to look the prospect of our own death in the eye. His German word, translated in English as antis anticipation, for Laufen, means literally like running towards. So we run towards our death, we don't run away from it. Uh, and of course he has some wonderful passages, drawing partly on Tolstoy's short story, The Death of Ivan Illich, about how even when someone is dying, of course, we go to visit them and we say, oh, everything's all right, hope, you know, hope you're fine, don't worry too much, things will be okay. You know, say, saying just about anything uh, except what directly and truthfully states what's going on. But no, we need to confront the truth about ourselves, and that is that we are each of us singly going to die. And that none of our... This, as it were, reflects back onto the finitude of all of our possibilities, all of our human relationships, all of our work projects, all of our political programs, our technical projects, all of these are limited. We may try to absolutize them in our minds, but none of them can really bear the weight of absoluteness. Maybe it's a little bit like what Kierkegaard said in concluding unscientific postscript about being relative with the relative. Well, Kierkegaard also said we must be absolute with the absolute and relative with the relative, but for Heidegger it seems there's no absolute. Human beings are just thrown into the world, thrown towards their death, that's their condition, they have to accept that. 
I think at this point, there's two very different ways of hearing what Heidegger's saying. One way is to hear it as a sort of heroic confrontation with death, you know, looking death in the eye, running towards it, authentically resolute. Um, a little bit like a civilian version of the soldier, you know, and Heidegger is the first World War generation going over the top, running towards the enemy lines. But at the same time, he's also saying, you know, when, when you do this, actually 